get started. So we have plenty of time to ask questions and talk about whatever we want to talk about. Ooh, carrots. They like carrots yeah. too. Or is that papaya? Carrots. Oh, okay. It has almost an orangey papaya yeah. color oh, to it. Gonna take them away and give them yeah. Those arms. I got my eye on that bowl over there too. It's, she's gonna <laughs> eat it all up. She'll eat it all. Um, she won't give you. Okay. Anything. Well, welcome to another workshop for those of you who have been here before and for those that are are new. Um, the workshops have been. The titles, the subjects have been uh, kind of all over the place, but really they're all on the central theme of how we can live more sustainably from various aspects of growing our own food, raising our own food, doing our, our own things. And uh, this workshop is the same idea, is that we tend, if, if you eat food at home, you tend to have a lot of stuff that you don't eat peelings and scraps and cores and skins and eggshells and so on that most people don't eat. And that goes in, in often cases, into the garbage, which goes to the landfill as solid waste and becomes a problem. Uh, not your waste, but a few million people's waste becomes a serious problem. Uh, and it's kind of a silly thing to be doing because that organic material is really a rich resource. It's as rich as coal or oil or anything else in, in its own way. And we shouldn't be throwing it away. We should be making use of it. The trick is how do you make good use of it so that you get the benefit out of it without you know, having rotten garbage hanging around the house. And uh, nobody needs that. And uh, composting is the way that most people deal with organic solid waste. And uh, probably one of the better ways, I think, to do that is to take that solid waste and run it through a worm. And once you run it through a worm, then it's ready to go for plants. What you're doing is taking mostly plant material, that's your, your solid waste, organic material, and breaking it down into a material that plants can use. Plants can't use an apple core or a banana peel or an eggshell, but the contents of that are good nutrients for plants. So just like in nature where the leaves and everything have to break down into the soil and to be a useful form uh, by microbes and everything else, uh, that's what we're doing in composting. With vermicomposting or worm composting, we're just using uh, the natural system of u incorporating worms along with bacteria and fungi and a few other invertebrates uh, to break it down faster because we produce a lot of stuff in most homes, if you have a family especially, and we need to get it into a form that's useful. By doing it this way, we not only preserve the nutrients that are in all that food that we would have thrown away, we get it into a form that plants can use directly, and we also incorporate into it a lot of microbes that improve the soil and are beneficial to the plants. Uh, and that's done in, in these boxes in this system. So there's the benefits of reducing the waste stream out of our houses, uh, reducing our pollution, and making use of this resource. And this is often the problem with unsustainable activities is we treat resources as though they're problems instead of recognizing it as a resource and making use of it. We do the same thing with our own sewage. Sewage is treated like, oh, geez, I don't even want to talk about that. You know, it's, it's, we just need to flush it away. And it's a mammoth resource that we're wasting and turning it into a problem by putting it out into the environment in various ways, septic tanks and lagoons and so on. But anyway, with food, this is one thing that everybody can do. It's very simple. Uh, it's very economical and it works. And if you are interested, I hope you'll see today a couple of ways to do it. Uh, what I brought here today are two worm bins, this one and this one. This one is an established worm bin that's full of worms right now. And uh, it's one that we have here at school. And so what I'll show you uh, later on with this is how do you harvest what's in the worm bin to make use of it. Uh, this is a new worm bin, it's, uh, it's my own, it's the small one that I have at home. Um, and so I brought it in to set it up and show you how do you set one up. These are just two designs. There's a third design, where did it go? A mini bin that's really, really small. It's full of worms and they're eating 
the scraps that are in there. Uh, this cheesecloth is obviously to keep them in, but they need air. They need fresh air all the time, so they're in there. And we can take a look at that later. But there are all kind, and there are wooden bins, there are plastic bins, and all kinds of things. A lot of people make their own out of. You recognize this maybe as simple tubs that they sell in uh, any hardware store. I won't mention the big box names, but any hardware store. And they're easy enough to use as a worm bin as long as you provide aeration and uh, cover to keep the worms dark and in there. <clears throat> so let's talk first about who we're dealing with here. Um, I brought some from my other worm bin here just to use to start this one. But these worms are red wigglers. Uh, People tend to think of worms as worms as worms, but there's a lot of different kinds of species of worms, and we're asking these worms to live in a contained box that's under uh, different conditions than in the forest or in the ground. Not all worms adapt to that well. Uh, night crawlers that people might use for fishing, or earthworms that you see in your garden that are can be couple inches long and nice and plump and good for fishing too, I guess, um, don't do well in this kind of containment. They don't like the moisture, the temperature, and uh, the, they want to go deeper. Night crawlers particularly go six or eight feet deep, and then they come up at night to uh, eat. And that's primarily to get where it's cool. Uh, and earthworms are a little bit shallower than that, but they'll be down a foot or so. How many people here know the story of Herman the Worm? Oh my goodness. I've never heard it. Will you tell it's us? It's a great, oh, it's a long story. That's all right. It would be like an hour. I like hearing you talk. <laughs> it I've taken every Herman the Worman. You gotta, you gotta get the story. Um, but anyway, they, they like to stay down in the ground. Uh, these worms, the red wigglers, the reason we use them is because they adapt well to the container. But these are the worms, if you were to go out into the forest, and just pull away some leaves if you get a nice area where there's a lot of dead leaves on the ground and you find a few worms on the surface, these are the ones. They live right under the surface of the organic matter. You might think, oh, they're just baby earthworms. They're not baby earthworms. They're red wigglers, uh, these guys. And they are the first ones at the surface to get the organic matter that's falling, dead insects, birds, leaves, whatever it is. Um, and they are the ones that are adapted here, and that's the ones you need to use. People do raise earthworms and night crawlers in bins, uh, particularly if they have an interest in having them for fish bait. Uh, and they work, but they're not going to consume the amount of organic matter that these guys will. These reproduce incredibly, as Sue mentioned. They are really horny. And they, they make a lot of worms, so you get a lot of them, and they eat a lot. A worm will eat half its weight every day. So if you weigh 100 pounds, right? If you weighed 100 pounds, nice. that would mean you would eat 50 pounds a day. Jerry back there weighing in at 200 and what? <laughs> 180. 180. Okay, that means you eat 90 pounds a day if you were a red wiggler. So they can process a lot of food, much more than earthworms or night crawlers will process. And that's what we need, is we need a lot of processing. So you figure their weight every two days is going through them. That's a lot of, lot of material. What they're eating are any organic matter. I mean, if you put in shredded paper, those brown paper towels, uh, as those towels sort of disintegrate in the moisture and the bacteria start to break them down, fungi break them down, the er earthworms will take them another step and digest them and run them through their body. And what comes out in the end is what we call worm castings. It's worm poop. It's worm castings. And that's what's in here a lot of. And that's what is so rich to put into your plants. And you mix that in about a quarter worm castings to three quarters soil. Uh, soil mixture. Some people mix 50 to 50 if you've got really poor soil and you think you need more organic matter. Or you can use it to make worm casting tea. As you put it in a bag, a cloth bag, an old sock, and you soak it in a five gallon bucket for a day or two, and then you use that water to water your plants. That gives an enormous boost to the microbial content. It's not high in nutrients, but it's high in microbes. And that's what most of our soils are deficient in, is the microbiology of the soil, not so much the chemical issues of the soil. 
Uh, <clears throat> so that's who these guys are, the red wigglers. And what I thought I would do is I'll start off, uh, there are obviously two styles of, of uh, worm bins. Let me just explain uh, this one. And uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to any design. So there's no one, which is the best one? Well, it depends on you and what you're going to do and what you like. Because somebody might prefer this one, somebody this one. This one can al also be made into a stackable if you just get multiple bins and put them inside each other. Uh, so you can make your own. This is a commercially made one. It's called the Worm Factory 360. If you Google it, you'll get it. Lots of places sell them all over the place. Um, it's nice because it's, it's well made um, and it out of recycled plastic. And it comes with a lot, all the stuff you need. It even comes with a little rake, so if you don't like digging with your fingers and with the worms. Um, one of the rules you have to remember with uh, going into a worm bin with your worms is please don't ever go in with a trowel. Ugh. That's like a guillotine going down through them. You don't ever dig in with a, a trowel, anything that's a blade. Think of a blade and a long worm. Uh, no, the both halves won't grow into new worms. One half will heal, the other half will die. Uh, so it's, it's not a, it, hopefully, so it's not a good idea. So we, any kind of trowel, garden fork or something is good. This comes with this one, so it's, it's easy. Uh, these are stackable so that uh, worms move up from the bottom. Worms, red wigglers, tend to keep moving to the surface. As I said, they're under the leaf litter. They like to stay near the top because they like to get the fresh stuff. That's what we're after. That's what we want to give them. And so we start them at the bottom, and these trays all come apart. And the base is just this. And you'll notice there's a part in here that's a square ring. This is like a basin in here to catch what's called leachate. That's the liquid that drips down because the food you're putting in has a lot of water content. And eventually that will drip down into here and then there's a faucet here to take that out. That's really good for watering your plants. If you don't have something like this, like in this one, it will tend to leak out the vents and can make a little bit of a mess if you don't have a way to uh, catch it. This ring in here is important because it goes right in there in that bowl and it's called a worm ladder. Sometimes worms will fall down from the trays into here and then they get trapped down in here. Well, they have a ladder here they can crawl back up because their tendency will be, they're like bees if anybody has honeybees, they tend to want to always be going upwards for some reason. It's just they're hardwired to do that. Uh, and the worms will do the same. So if they fall in here, you have this worm ladder to catch, uh, let them get back up to the bottom tray. Each of these trays has got, I put the paper in already, but you can see it's very open uh, meshwork in the bottom uh, for drainage and aeration. And in the bottom tray, the first one that we would put in, I put in newspaper just to sort of catch debris so we don't get a lot of our material down in here in the beginning. That's going to be where we start the worm bin, is in the bottom tray uh, with the paper on top. The other ones are we'll get to in a little bit. You can use almost anything you've got in here except just dirt. Uh, dirt is a little bit dense, it tends to pack. If it's clay dirt or stony dirt, it takes up a lot of space uh, and what you want is an organic mix. What you can get for these, sorry, what you can get with these, you can buy this in nurseries everywhere now or you can get your own, um, is coir or uh, core. Uh, these are bricks of uh, coconut husk fiber. This happens to be from Sri Lanka. It's normally a waste product uh, of the coconut industry. And somebody found out if you shred it up real fine and pack it into a hard brick, you can sell it to nurseries. It's a great alternative for potting soil uh, instead of peat moss. As we've now realized peat, peat and peat moss is mined out of wetlands and it requires destroying of wetlands to get peat moss. So when you buy your bag of sphagnum moss or peat for your plants in your garden, uh, essentially what you're doing is paying somebody to destroy a wetland somewhere, probably in Canada. 
Uh, this doesn't require destruction of any habitat. This is just a waste product of the coconut industry. Um, and it comes in, I buy them in this kind of brick for my planting, um, and, or you can get them in thinner bricks. I took this brick, which was that big and that thin, and broke it in half and put it in this tray with water, and it's now soaked up the water so it looks like that. So it's four times as, as big. It holds an enormous, this thing was, had a lot of water in it, a couple inches. It's all now in here. And then you just take this, and as you can see, it breaks up into nice, loose, rich organic matter. And it's not acidic or anything, so it doesn't bother anybody uh, that lives in it. What they provide with this, and this is really the lazy way of doing it, and I'm sure you can figure out a way to come up with this, particularly if you work here at school, shredded newspaper. You know where there's a shredder around somewhere? There's lots of shredders in the offices. If you don't have a shredder at home, you can take a pair of scissors and chop up something. Um, and you just mix this, and that's food. That's food for the worms. It's bedding material is what we're building here, but it's also food. For these thin trays, we don't need the whole amount. And Jeff? Yes. Sorry. Um, just a question. The ink in the newspaper? No. No, it's soy-based ink. They don't use lead-based ink anymore. Not even in colored stuff because people handled it. And they realize, oh, gee, maybe that's not a good idea to be poisoning our subscribers <laughs> uh, and making them dumber with lead, you know, um, which is what lead sort of does to you. So I just, you mix it up. Now, and that's the organic matter that will be the bedding. And you like it to be the moisture level of a wet sponge. Uh, you know, you don't want it dripping out all over the place, but it should be plenty moist. Uh, for the worms, because uh, that's the way they like it, and they have to be moist to be healthy. The other thing that worms uh, need is they are uh, sort of like birds. They digest their food in a gizzard. Does anybody know what a gizzard is in a bird? It's a bird's Chick stomach. It's one of their stomachs. Do you know what the gizzard is? Wait, what? what happens in the gizzard? Do you ever, anybody here have chickens? I wonder who. Do you ever see chickens out alongside the road picking at the stones and the gravel? What are they getting out of that? Stones and gravel. They need stones in their gizzard because they don't have, anybody ever see hen's teeth? They don't have teeth. They don't have teeth. So what they have is grit in their gizzard. And the food goes in there and then it uh, grinds all around in this gizzard and this substitutes as their teeth in chickens. Same thing in worms. Worms will take in, they need some grit. Often it's sand that's in the soil, uh, or anything that's ground up. Eggshells that are pulverized, if you dry your eggshells so they pulverize real well. The uh, shell pardon me? The shell driveway, the oyster shell driveway. Yeah, yeah, the oyster shell driveway. If you get some really fine stuff, obviously their mouths are very, very tiny, so you can't give them big bites. But um, it will break down. I mean, things like this that's put in there uh, will break down uh, and break apart as it's wet and as the worms go through it. These worms all have grit in their gizzard because they've already been living in a, uh, a bin that has that. But I put it in just to show you that you do need some grit in there. It could be just sand, like play, playground sand that you buy in a bag for a sandbox or something like that uh, that's clean sand. Uh, uh, if you get it from the beach, that's fine, as long as it's been rinsed a little bit with water so it's not salty, uh, that would be fine. And you just mix these things in and that's their home. You've made a soil for them. Some people will take a little bit of soil from their garden or outside if they have nice soil and mix that in. That inoculates uh, with some of the organisms in the soil, um, some of the bacteria and fungi that are naturally out there. And then this just goes in on top of that paper. Of course, it spills out real easily.
don't want to leave any of that. And you just kind of spread it around in there. And you can't see it, I know, but it's a little more than an inch or two inches thick, uh, deep in there. We don't want to make it too deep. I don't want to fill this box at all because we're going to be putting food in here. And we're going to keep adding and adding and adding. And that will add to the soil. And we don't want this to get too full so that there's not room for food and, and worms. But this makes for their bedding that they can grow in and live in. And they're perfectly happy in that kind of uh, setup. The second thing to do is put the food in. I'm going to give them Trader Joe's organic sugar because uh, these guys are all like sweet. They have sweet teeth. Worms don't have teeth. Okay. Well, then I won't put sugar in. I just happen to have the bag. Uh, this is uh, butternut squash skin. Um, happens to be from my garden because we chopped up a butternut squash last night. Um, and what they recommend you do, and I, I don't think it's critical to the success of the bin, but it's recommended just so you can watch things, is you put it in a corner. And I like to put it in two corners, some over there and some back here. They love cantaloupe peeling, the skin, uh, squash peeling, um, banana peels. Don't worry about the paper label, they'll Those eat. Organic bananas? Yes. So um, coffee and the bag, it's paper. So you'll find, um, when you dig in here around the coffee, you'll find a mass of worms around that coffee uh, in a little while. Um, tea bags uh, in the bag. Yes? You don't have to break things up small, they'll take care of everything? Well, these things are small. I mean, and that'll, you could break it open if you want. And then like the coffee filter or? It's pretty well deteriorated and it'll come apart. Um, I wouldn't put, I don't put big things in like corn cobs or big chunks of squash skin. Uh, I usually chop it up. The, they'll get to it eventually, it's just they'll get to it faster if it's chopped up. And it'll break down faster if it's chopped up. They have very little mouths, you know, so they can't take a big bite out of something uh, that's too big. But now I've got this in two corners, here and here, the food. I will put the worms across the middle from this corner to this corner. The reason I separate them is because I'll put them into the bedding and they're going to need a period of adjustment. Uh, worms do not like to be disturbed, uh, have their earth turned upside down and mixed all around. Obviously that's not a natural thing to be happening to a worm and it, it stresses them. Uh, so it's going to take them a little while to adjust to figure out their new system and where they're at. And by putting the food in the corner, I can check this day by day and see, have they moved into the food? Once they've moved into the food, then I know they're happy and they're starting to eat. They've settled down, they've accepted their new home, and they're starting to eat. They will. They will. They'll get over it, okay, the trauma. They will. This um, bin, I just put, put them in here because I dug them out of the other bin. And as you can see, one of the things I use is a lot of leaves. These are leaves from last year. They're all kind of chopped up. Some of them are broken up. Leaves are perfectly good for uh, worm bins. And um, so they'll add to the bedding. And as we get the leaves off the top, we can start to see some of the uh, material that's in here. And as we get the leaves off, we start to see tails disappearing. Um, maybe I can just come around and you can, you can see as I pull, you see who's in there. You might look at it and not see anybody, but they're in there and they're hiding because they, it's very interesting to me that worms do not have eyes, but they are very sensitive to daylight. They don't like daylight. Daylight is a bad thing to a worm because obviously that's where their predators live is in the daylight with, with worms. And they'll disappear very quickly unless I keep disturbing them. And see, now these are red wigglers. These are a little bit smaller than your typical earthworm. Although there might be a couple of earthworms in here too. 
See? Yes. See? Do you want to pet them? No. Now, that okay. indigenous to here? I, I think Earth, how earthworms are an invasive species. They came from here. They were brought over by, from Europe, probably by accident. Before the Columbian exchange, before Columbus invaded and all the Europeans invaded and brought everything, all the diseases and animals and plants with them, one of the things they brought with them was earthworms. Probably in pots or bags or something with plants. Just, with lots of plants <coughs> Didn't just they, accidentally. But weren't there, there were worms, no. different species. Not, not earthworms. Not earthworms. Not in North America. And they've spread from ocean to ocean in no time. But they're not a bad thing. Right? No, it turns out, well, it's it depends. Good. They're a bad thing for, ironically, birds. What? I thought birds yeah. ate worms. They do. But worms also compete with, uh, worms compete with birds for a lot of their food. And so they are, and they find populations of birds are lower and fewer species in areas where there's lots of worm population. There's an inverse correlation. They, they're competitors that you wouldn't imagine how worms could compete with birds, but they do. Because they eat a lot of the organic matter that birds depend on to raise insects that birds eat. And the worms break it down really fast. Yeah, but then the worms can just eat, I mean, then the birds can eat the worms and get, well, get it both ways. Well, like, yeah. worms aren't easy to get. Because they stay underground, and you know, robins dig for worms, and woodcock dig for worms, but they're, they're, they have a good defense. They go down, and birds can't chase them. Um, so anyway, we put that in. I'll just put them all right across the middle. There's maybe a thousand worms in here. Uh, I didn't count them. Uh, there's Shirley. Uh, See, it's solid worms. And, but as I say, they do not like daylight. And so they will go down initially. Uh, that's why I wanted that newspaper on the bottom, because I don't want them to go down and out the bottom of this right away. Uh, and once they get stabilized in here, then they'll start thinking about going up to where the food is. There's another newspaper here. And we put a newspaper on the top. It doesn't have to seal it or cover it or anything. I just put it around on the top and soak it. And it's just a way to keep things wet uh, inside. The, the material, the medium, is pretty wet already. But the paper just sort of forms a little bit of an evaporation barrier for them. And so I just put that wet paper on top and keep that there. And that'll help cover them uh, and keep the inside wet. And then we put the cover on because we don't want them to escape. In the daytime, they won't come out, not in the daylight. But at night, if there were ways to get out, they're exploring all the time. And they might come out and explore uh, if you left it open uh, at night. And then they so, dry up and die. Yeah, and then they dry up and die because they don't know that there's bad, bad habitat out there. Um, so we cover them up. And uh, then they're, they can't get out. And they're where they want to be anyway, because that's where the food is and where it's dark and moist. So they, as far as they're concerned, they've, you know, they're in their own home, which they are. Um, that's the way you start the worm bin. The advantage of this style of worm bin is then, once I notice that this is getting kind of full, up to about an inch from the top, and the food in here is being consumed, and there's a lot of decayed, well-composted material in here already, then I can start the next layer. And I'll push this down so it will come in contact with the material underneath. No newspaper here, because I want the worms to come up through that bottom. And then I'll just start putting my kitchen scraps in here. And that will draw them up. They won't come all up at once. I mean, it's not like overnight. But gradually, as they realize there's more food up here than there is down below, they'll, they'll finish what's below, and then they'll move up to the next level. And when that one's done, I can add another one and move them up. And then I can add the last one and move them up. And you can get more of these if you want, you, you know, as high as you want. And then when the worms are up in one of the upper levels, I can take off the bottom one 
where there will be almost no worms because they will have all moved up to where the food is. And there's my bin of castings to use in plants and soil in, or making tea and so on. So it just keeps going up. And when this is like this, you can keep this in your kitchen and not have a problem. Uh, a couple of problems that people can develop with uh, worm bins is fruit flies, which usually come in with your bananas and apples and so on on the skins. Uh, if you don't wash them when you get them, that's by the way, if you notice in the wintertime you get fruit flies in your house because of bananas and such. If you would wash them when you got them from the supermarket, you would wash the eggs off because they hatch right then. Hmm? That's where they come from. It's from the stuff you brought from the store. These will also sometimes attract them because of the fruit that you've put in there. That's why I keep the newspaper on top and I always keep a layer of dead leaves on top. The fruit flies don't like that. They don't like to land on dry stuff and go down through underneath. They don't like to go in there. And uh, so we don't get fruit flies when we've got all that litter. This bin that is established is very heavy. You can see I've got a lot of leaves on top. And we don't have any fruit flies, even though there's a lot of fruit and produce in there. Because the fruit flies just are not willing to deal with all of that. And what's in here, these are just leaves from around the grounds here that were um, run over by the lawnmowers. And yeah. one thing you'll notice in here, there's a, there's a thing sticking out of the ground. I put that in, that's the last place I fed them. That's where I put in food last week. And I, I rotate between the corners so that I'm not always putting it in the same place. I put it, wherever that is, I'll put it in a different, I can never remember two weeks ago where I put it, but at least I can mark one week ago. And then I'll put it in a different corner and just kind of rotate around so that the food gets spread around in different places. And it keeps the worms on their toes, so to speak. So they have to keep moving around looking for the new food. They seem to have no problem finding it. They have a very keen sense of, of smell and chemical sensations that um, they can find things in the soil at, at good distances. We get some like that. In this one, you could take another bin just like this, drill a lot of holes in the bottom, and set it on top. But this is, and they would move up to the next level and the next and the next. In this case, so this one isn't set up to do that. And so this is like a batch type of arrangement. And if you, you can see the worms in there when I rake aside. Here's where all the food was. Oh, sorry, it was over here. It's an apple, piece of apple there. Things like apples should be cut up small because that's kind of hard. But as I go down in, you'll see the worms that are in there. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's the same thing that was in the other bin. Um, and if you don't like to handle them, you can get one of these little forks, but you can see there's solid worms in there. And they're all working on, on various things. But this, when you start to see this organic matter, this black, everything is dark brown, very crumbly and broken down, that's the good stuff. That's, that's what's good. Oh, that's the, that's the next step. Um, I think the lab is finished next door. I couldn't go in the lab and get what I wanted to show you this um, before because there was a class. Just talk amongst yourselves and I'll be right back. Okay, how, so how do we separate the worms from, uh, from the castings? We take advantage of the worm's natural avoidance to light. Right now, by opening this up, they've already gone down some in here, away from the surface, when I took the leaves off the surface. Uh, so I'm going to have to dig a little bit deeper. But if I had a bigger tray, I could just dump the whole thing out. But I won't do that. But all you need to do is put them out like this, take a load out. If you had it outside, you could put it in the sun. If it's inside, you put this on there, and they will then moose down as fast as they can. And then you just take off what's on the top. See? Take off a layer and then let them go down. And as you can see, there's some on top. And they'll go down in as fast as they can. 
they may hesitate for a second because they have to stretch out and burrow. But then as soon as you take off the next la load, yes. <laughs> the ones that are there will head down. And eventually, you, as you skim off the top, you'll get down to just a very thin layer. And that's what you put back in, either into another bin or back in the same bin. And unfortunately, by opening this up, I've kind of driven them down already kind of deep. And so there's, you know, as you can see, they're, when they're in there on the top, they're all over the top. But they won't be there for long. They'll, they'll head down to get away from the light. Yeah, they're already moving. And uh, I don't know how they do that, unless they feel the heat from the light, the warmth, the, uh, you know, the infrared uh, from the light. But uh, they have no eyes. But they certainly don't like light. Because that's, to them, that's a bad place to be. That's where they're vulnerable. That's where frogs and lizards and birds are that eat them. So they, they don't want to be in the light at all. And so you just keep skimming it off. And there are, you can use that sort of trench. There's a little scraper. You can use kitchen tools like scrapers and just kind of cut it off and separate it aside. Then you take this material. This is your castings. This is black gold. This is very rich organic matter for your plants. If you have house plants that are struggling, mix a little bit of this in with the potting soil. And you'll see a different plant in a very short period of time. Does top dressing help? I mean, will the nutrients yep. as you water? Yeah, and then as you water, it'll leach down in if it's already in an established pot. But you can dig it in. Or if you're mixing up new potting soil, mix it right in with it. Um, a lot of it is the microbes that are in there, the microbiology that you're setting up. It's, uh, there's a lot of all the nutrients of all the food that they've been fed is there. But then the uh, microbes, the bacteria and fungi, uh, that keep the whole system going. This is a whole ecosystem here. It's not just you know, garbage and worms. There's a lot of living things in here going on. And as long as you keep it healthy and keep feeding it, it'll just keep processing this stuff. Is there ever a situation you can, where you have too many worms? If you feed them a lot, you can get the reproduction going. Well, yeah. Like put some in, I mean, the, the, at the very least, just take some out and put them in your garden. Yeah. Yeah. They will balance themselves, though. I mean, it, it's, overpopulation in nature doesn't happen, at least not for long. Human beings aside. Um, Human, humans are an exception, but in nature, overpopulations don't happen for long. If a, if a population peaks too high, it will eventually go back down by some mechanism. And same thing with worms. They're not going to just keep it growing until they're pouring over the sides. You know, I mean, they're only going to grow as big as the space will allow them and the food will allow them. Because um, this is their home. They need places to live. They need room to get away from each other. Sometimes they want a little quiet time, you know, just to get off in a corner and read a good book or something. Dr. Corbett, um, <laughs> I've always been told with, and I, had a, I have a warm mint too, never put um, onions, garlic. Yeah, I was going to get to the sort of what can you give them. Um, so it's, it's pretty open. It's pretty flexible. There's not very many limits. It's probably easier to say what you shouldn't put in versus all the things you can put in. You can put in pretty much anything. Uh, but generally, it's recommended not to use onions, not to use citrus, uh, because it's very acidic, and worms don't like acidic uh, things. No animal products. No uh, cheese, meat, bones, chickens, parts. Will that kill the worms? Or is it it, no, it, it mostly is you get an anaerobic fermentation going, and then it can bit, get smelly. Worms don't like the acidicness of um, citrus or onions or garlic, because they're very acidic what also. What about all the leaves, all that tannic acid? It's tannic acid, but it's not that acidic. It's not like citrus or lemon or lime or something. Um, some people have said, oh, you shouldn't put pineapple in. Pineapple is great for worms. They love it, even though pineapple is acidic. Uh, for some reason, pineapple isn't a problem. And I've seen at a pineapple processing plant where they will have piles of the skins that come off the machines where they're canning them. And you go out and find the pile of pineapple skins and kick it aside, and it'll just be livid with worms. Don't hurt you. 
So you want to, but some animal things would be okay, such as eggshells. I mentioned eggshells. Uh, they're okay. I just dry them and then crumble them up, break them up in your hands and put them in. That makes a little bit of grit. I don't think the worms eat a lot of that. They may get, what worms are really eating is bacteria and fungi. They're not eating the, the raw food that you're putting in there so much. Is they're eating the bacteria and fungi that are growing on the surface. So when you put in fresh food, sometimes it'll take a few days before they'll be on it because it takes a few days before those bacteria and fungi cover the food. But then as they start to break it down, then they can start eating the food as well. But they're not going to take a bite out of an apple, you know, a fresh, crisp apple. They, they don't do that. But as soon as it starts to de degrade a little bit, then they'll eat it. And the bacteria that are in, of course, the bacteria and fungi go right through them and out the backside and into the castings um, and multiply as they grow. Uh, well, the, the, the vents like these are just, you just get a hole saw. And I could snap these out, but these are the vents you can buy in any hardware store that are used for vents, uh, like in soffit vents or in tool uh, sheds, garden sheds and stuff that will often have little vents up in the peaks. They sell these, There's some are rectangular, some are round. And you can put a spigot in, in the bottom. Um, and there are, yeah, on that list of uh, wormy references, there's a number of plans for making your own. And what some of them will do is uh, you just drill a hole right at the bottom, no, you and you get a little spigot, and you just put it in there. And you know, screw it in on both sides so it's sealed and watertight, so you can drain the, the moisture out, let it drip. Uh, and these little vents, these two go to the other side through a tube. There are two tubes. Yeah, they're connected. There's two tubes, so air can flow all the way through and then aerate the bottom. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> it's little, little pieces of pipe with yeah. fun, really, and remember you have to make the holes. If you do them yourself, make the holes smaller than the worms. So you don't want to have quarter inch holes because then the worms will. I'll, I'll tell you there was a fellow who was going to bring in his homemade um, oh. bin, but he forgot to bring it in I this know. morning. Uh, um, but he essentially got a bin like this, and they, you know the ones that they come with a cover. I mean, that's all these companies are doing yeah. that, that sell these. They're just buying bins. And then there's even a company, and it's listed on there called Ben's Bins. He's up in um, Holyoke or Amherst, up in that area. That He makes uh, a really nice uh, bin, two sizes. But he also is coming out with a kit with all of the parts uh, for it. And so you just, you don't have to, you buy your own bin and you buy his parts with the instructions and make your own that way. Because some of them will put a, a mesh across the bottom that's equivalent like to this mesh in the bottom of these bins uh, for drainage and then a spigot out the side so you can drain the leachate, uh, which is really, really good stuff to water your plants with. And you can water that straight or you can dilute it however you want. It's not potent in any way um, like the tea and, and so on to water plants. And what you're doing is, inoculating your soil with microbes. That's really what most soil needs, particularly in, in gardens. In containers, it's a little difficult because microbes don't survive there very well in small pots. But, oh, that's a good point. They don't like to be hot. So you don't want to put them anywhere where they'll be in the sun. And you don't want to put them anywhere in the wintertime where they would freeze, because uh, this would freeze solid and kill them. Uh, so it needs, like in a basement, a cellar, a uh, garage maybe, if it's, uh, um, but it is important to keep them out of the sun, because this black box would be like a little oven, and they can't get away from it. They're trapped in here. Um, it can be in the house, in the cellar, in a, a cool place. And that, that brings up a, another point of the advantage of, well, why not just have a compost pile? Uh, and get rid of all our kitchen scraps in a simple compost pile, stir it up every once in a while outside, and, and that works fine. And that does work fine, and that's an excellent thing to do. But in the wintertime, when we have a normal winter, not this year, but when we have a normal winter when things freeze, your compost pile, if you've got it in a container or, or not, it freezes solid. 
and essentially nothing happens all winter long. It just stops. And you can keep adding to it and whatever you put there will just freeze and sit there and look at you for the winter. And then come spring as it thaws and warms up, it'll start working and gradually it'll get going and you'll get caught up. With this, you've got your compost pile inside and it's going all winter long. Um, so it keeps the compost going through the season when normally composting doesn't work too well. And I think if you get a collection bin for your kitchen, um, for your kitchen scraps for compost, you will be amazed how much stuff you produce for compost. People think, oh, well, I want to have a banana peel and an apple core and a piece of lettuce now and then. It's never going to amount to anything. Start collecting it. Yeah. Collect all your coffee filters, all your tea bags, all your banana peels, all your apple cores, all that stuff. And you're going to find you're going to have that bin needs to be emptied every other day. It's going to be a, you know, like twice that size full. Uh, in a nor I mean, that's just two of us in my house. And of course, that's all we eat is plants, but um, it fills up. I usually put it like in this one or these uh, at least once a week. Once a week. So you would like save it up and then put it in. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if you had this in your kitchen, and I've seen these in people's kitchens, right, in, tucked away somewhere in their kitchen, they just put the stuff directly in there every day. And that's fine too. I mean, the worms are happy with whatever you give them. And uh, they don't keep you awake at night. They don't complain. They behave, never complain. You know? And uh, they just keep working away. And the more you feed them, the more they'll reproduce. And the more they reproduce, the more they will digest. And so it's just a positive reinforcement thing going on. And it's very self-sustainable and very beneficial. And like I say, cuts down on your solid waste and it adds to your fertility. Uh, Jen, you said onion, citrus, not good for the worms, but that's still good for your compost. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep, sure. Citrus breaks down pretty slowly, so things like that I tend to chop up, you know, uh, a, a little bit to help it along because it is slow. And corn, they love corn cobs. Uh, so when you get sweet corn in the summertime, they love, be, the worms really love corn cobs. But imagine a corn cob, you know, it's a pretty big hunk of stuff. They can't really, they, I think they like it because it's so porous and a lot of bacteria and fungi grow in all of the, uh, Crevices. crevices and holes and pores and they go after that but I the way to deal with that is just <coughs> we chop the cobs up a little bit chop them in half chop them lengthwise and open them up and they break down pretty fast that way if you put whole corn cobs in here they'll be there a month or two later they'll be deteriorating but they'll still be there uh, so things like that chop up tomatoes apple cores anything you can chop up um, peelings, you probably don't, you know, I chopped up the squash peelings a bit, but the more you chop it up, the faster it'll get digested and composted. It, it'll eventually all get composted, but if you're producing it every day, you want to keep them moving and help them a little bit. And so we tend to tear things up a little bit. Um, no, muskmelon, the kind that's got the rough, the rough, edges. The rough uh, right. skin on it. Uh, take a slice of that. And put it, put put them face down always when you put things in there. Just put one in face down, maybe in the middle where you can leave it, and then come back and check it in a couple of weeks. And all you'll see is like a fish net. It'll be like a lace net of what is left, and all the pulp, all the flesh is gone yeah, it's from underneath. It's just a lacy yeah. a network of the hardest fibers are left, and eventually those will go too. Whenever there's something to drain. It entirely is variable according to what you've been putting in. How and you can moisture? visually see it then somewhere. <laughs> no, you just open it. Just put a, it you just keep a little bowl down. there, a plastic it bowl, and, comes out, comes out. Yeah. and it'll come out like, it'll look like tea. It'll, it'll just look like tea or coffee, you know, type of. Depending on how much moisture it is. And you do have to remember to keep them wet, too, not just feed them. We have to give them a little bit right. of water. Right. Well, and that's why I keep the newspaper on. So then when that newspaper is dry, then I'll re-soak it. If it's wet, then I don't put anything, don't put any water in. So the newspaper is sort of the, the gauge. With this one, it's very wet, but it's because we have all these leaves on top, so it doesn't evaporate and dry very much at all. And, um, oops, 
So um, when, you, when you start, you put the bedding in, but you never have to add any more bedding? Oh, you're, you're adding all the time. You're adding the food for them, which becomes bedding. You add the food, right, yeah. but you don't have to do that. Now, in this one, you can have much more bedding. In this one, the bedding is limited because the, each bin is fairly shallow. You know, it's only that deep. And you only want the bedding to get up to there so that when you put the next one down, it just comfortably rests on the material underneath it so the worms can easily crawl up through it. They don't jump real well, so if they have, if they, as a gap there, they have trouble with it. But they'll just slide right up into the next one very easily. So you're not getting it very deep, whereas in this one, it's, you know, it's, it's much deeper. Dr. Corbin, for some reason, um, you weren't going to eat this year, you're just going to fast all year long. Newspaper yeah, newspapers, okay. paper towels, and, and leaves. Should, yeah, you should be given I mean, this is what anyway. they normally, you think, well, gee, that's kind of a poor diet. This is what they normally eat. This is what they eat out yeah. in the wild. So I keep this on top of here, mostly to keep fruit flies out and to kind of keep it insulated from temperature and moisture, but it's also a food supply. If they run out of the fresh goodies I put in there, they can just reach up and grab some leaves. And that's what they eat. As the le and the leaves are breaking down as they break down, and that's what the worms then will, will get into. So, you know, leaves. Um, one thing you do want to be careful of, for example, is um, grass clippings. You can put grass clippings in as long as the grass clippings are dry. Don't put in fresh green grass clippings uh, because it's a high nitrogen source and it will start composting and you'll get heat generation. And the worms will try to evacuate and they'll try to get out because they don't like hot. And as you know, a hot compost pile can be quite hot. It can easily get 130, 140 Fahrenheit. There's been fires and, that have burned down with... Yeah, because of compost uh, and burning. So uh, you want to keep it from getting uh, into active hot composting. And one of the quickest ways to, to do that by mistake is to put green grass clippings in. So if you're going to, and grass is perfectly fine, just like the leaves, but let the grass clippings dry out first. Let them dry out until they're brown and thoroughly dried. And on a summer day, that might only take, you know, two or three days, four days. And, uh, and then you can add it if you need to add something. That's perfectly good. Any other questions? Comments, stories? No, you're just going to yeah. think of a lot of names for all your pet. Oh, my God, then I have to keep a list on my database so I can recognize everybody. The red wing of those worms. I'm sorry? The worms themselves, you said they are indigenous here? They're not. Or is that, oh, I'm sorry. They're not. They're European invaders that brought over with, uh, are you familiar with the, the, um, the idea of the Columbian Exchange? The Columbian Exchange is just a fancy way of saying all the stuff that started going back and forth between Europe, Africa, and Asia, and the American continents after uh, the Columbian connection was made, after the Columbian invasion happened. That, that includes worms, birds, uh, food, tobacco, diseases. You know, there were all kinds of things. And that changed the world. Well, we sent them back. Really, really what I'm trying to, trying to get to is, are, are these guys something that I can find in the backyard, or would I have to buy them? Oh, they're in your backyard. They're under your leaves, under, you know, if you look. They'll be the ones near the surface. These will be the ones you'll most right. likely find. Okay. And if you have a compost pile, either in a bin or a pile, just piled somewhere, uh, if you dig down into it, if it's been there for a while, you dig down into it, you'll find these worms. These will be the ones right under the surface. Right, right at the surface. These are the first ones that you see all the time. Yep. And if you find a bunch of them, you can use those for your worm bin. Okay. You put a piece of cardboard out a couple of weeks a week. I mean, it depends yeah. on the weather. Just keep looking at Or a rock. Now you pick up a rock and it's a bunch of worms. Of yeah, just don't, you know, if you see bigger earthworms or night crawlers, night crawlers, of course, will go real quick. Um, they're hard to catch anyway, but um, 
it's, these will be the ones in the surface. The earthworms are the ones that when you turn over a shovel full of dirt, and they, they're the ones that are there, and they're four times as big as these, at least, big and fat. Um, and those are not the ones you want to have in a bin because they just, they'll survive, but they don't really do well, and they don't eat a lot, and they're not real happy in this. But they're, really they're not domesticated. Soil. Pardon? They're very good for aerating the soil. They're the ones that go down, yeah, and make all the tubes in the soil so that the air and the water can get down to the deeper roots of your plants and so on. These guys have a different job. Their job is to break down the organic matter on the surface. The earthworms are the aeration. And you know, when, when everybody here knows who Charles Darwin was mm -hmm. and what he came up with. When Charles Darwin was near retirement and in older age, which was probably not that old then, um, he, his theory of natural selection and evolution had not really been well accepted and was sort of one of those fringe ideas that some crazy scientist was promoting. He sort of felt like his life as a scientist had been a failure. He hadn't really accomplished anything of great significance, which really bothered him because scientists like to accomplish things, you know, and make a difference. And so he decided to go off on a new field of study that would really be important and make a difference. His last books were earthworms, all about earthworms. That's what he wrote about because he realized earthworms are really the basis of agriculture, of soils, of, of our whole civilization is based on earthworm science. And he wrote some of the preeminent books about beginning studies of earthworms. Wow, I so I mean, here Darwin, who everybody knows him for evolution, whether you like it or not, that's what he's famous for, um, he felt that wasn't enough. I mean, that changed the world. That completely changed science. But he felt it wasn't enough, so he decided to write books on earthworms. And that's how he spent his last years was earthworms. So I mean, that, geez, if he thought they were important, they must have, you know, been worthwhile. I wonder what Jim can we pass around the little tub, and that way they can get a close. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to come up here and see the uh, the bins here on your way out. Don't forget to get the handouts. There's you can look in. and see what's been set up. 